Hi there, Richard Fulmer here. And welcome to another edition of Richard's Rock Rambles. So today we're going to change direction and we're going to start looking at the bands that comprise the genre called prog rock. It's a genre which has taken a fair bit of flack in its time. Uh, a lot of critics have said it's too highbrow and it's too sort of up there on what's it's with bands and, and artists, but I've always found it an interesting genre. Um, long passages, different time changes, all sorts. I mean, prog, there's all sorts of prog. And for me, it's a great genre. It just makes things a little interesting and mixes it up a bit. And I think over the last 10 years, it has had some sort of resurgence. It's become back in favor. So, uh, yeah, we're going to have a look at a couple of bands that make up this interesting genre. So, for this first episode, uh, we're going to have a look at the Canadian band Rush. In fact, for the next three, because they have quite a large discography, there's something like 19 studio albums, uh, 11 or so live albums, plus a whole bunch of compilations, which we're not going to get into because that's just like a, a greatest hits uh, there's also quite a few DVDs that they have released over the years. Sadly, a band that are no longer around. They uh, stopped last year with the death of their drummer, Neil Peart, or Peart. I'm not even quite sure how you say his surname. So they are no longer a, a going concern, but an amazing band. Three guys who, when you watch them on DVD or you were lucky enough to go to their concerts, the sound they came up with, just for three guys, was amazing. Um, bass, guitar, drums, and keyboards that uh, Geddy Lee, the bassist and vocalist, he started out with the whole pedal thing with the keyboard. So to watch him singing, playing the bass and the keyboards, knowing what he's got to sing, it's, it was amazing. One of the best, you know, if you're a trio, there's very little room for, er for error. So... These guys were locked in. They uh, all three were amazing musicians, top of their game. I mean, Neil Peart was one of the best rock drummers of all time, and Alex Lifeson on guitar was great as well. Not a flashy guitarist, he wasn't a Satriani or a Malmsteen, but what he did was just sufficient within that band structure. Uh, the lead breaks that he did do were just really very tasteful. Um, he could get quite fiery at times, a great uh, rhythm player as well, some great riffs. So yeah, all together a very rounded band and they were all really good friends. They grew up together and of course when they lost Neil last year, they decided that was it. They couldn't carry on with anybody else, which is fair enough. If you think back to Led Zeppelin, same story when John Bonham passed away. So as I said, 19 studio albums. They formed in Toronto, Canada in 1968. The original lineup was a guy by the name of John Ratzi on drums. Neil Peart doesn't join until the second album. Uh, John lasted for that first album and I think it's maybe a bit of touring, but he really wasn't into the whole touring aspect of things, so he left soon after. Um, Geddy Lee on bass and vocals and Alex Lifeson on guitar and vocals. Another band where you had... Two singers, which is great because then they can trade off and add something to the mix. John Ratzi, unfortunately, also passed away in 2008, so they've lost both drummers. So let's jump into the... Uh, what I've decided to do is, is break it up into three. So the first video I'm going to do for you is the early stuff, mainly from the 70s. Then we're going to go into the 80s and then into the 90s and beyond into the 2000s. And you'll see in the 80s... There's a lot more emphasis on keyboards and synthesizers. They changed their sound quite a bit, became a little bit more commercial. Didn't sit well with some of the uh, sort of traditionalist Rush fans, um, of which I am one. But I eventually embraced the later style and they still had their Rush sound. Um, but it was just a little different. You know, they were trying to crack a different market. And these guys have become or became as big as they were, not through a lot of airplay, they didn't get that, but through constant touring and a massive fan base, a fanatical fan base. Um, if you watch their final concerts from the Clockwork um, tour, you'll see that some of those fans have been them right from the beginning. 
So yeah, big fan base. So let's jump into the studio albums from the early days. First one we're going to chat about is the debut album simply called Rush. So this one features John Ratzi on drums, came out in 1974. If you listen to this, you can hear a lot of Zeppelin. Obviously, Zeppelin was still big at that time, probably at their peak. So there's a lot of Zepp influence, good rock album, hard rock, some blues rock. Not really the sound that would uh, become their staple later on, the Rush sound. This was more of a, what it was around at the time kind of sound, if you like. But a lot of these tracks, they actually played right up until the end. Finding My Way, that's the first track, a good rock track. Need Some Love, Take a Friend, Here Again, What You're Doing, In The Mood, which was another hit from this album, Before and After, and probably the best track on here, Working Man, all 7 minutes and 10 seconds of it. So even then, in the early days, they were starting to do slightly longer tracks. Um, as I said, a good rock album, um, not one of the most famous, but I think a good starting point. And if you can see that, there's a picture of the guys that's John Rutsey in the middle there. And uh, yeah, not a bad album. I still play from time to time, but it's not really the Rush sound. Then we move into the second album, Fly By Night, with a great cover there. So this would be the first album to feature drummer Neil Peart. Or Peart. Um, and this guy was not only a great drummer, but he was an amazing lyricist. He wrote pretty much all these songs afterwards. All the songwriting was done by him. A lot of um, fantasy imagery and all sorts of stuff came out. This guy was an avid reader as well, and you can hear it in his lyrics and uh, in his style of writing. And besides which, right from the get-go, you can hear when this guy was behind the kit, he was, a <laughs> he was quite a few steps up from John Rutsey. Um, so there's a picture of the guys in their 70s pomp with the long hair. That's Mr. Peart's put in the middle there. That's Geddy Lee and that's Alex Lifeson. So what do we have on here? Anthem, which with one of the greatest tracks on this album. And as the name suggests, very anthemic sounding, epic sounding. Um, a lot of melody as well in their music, which is great. Not just bombast, but a lot of melody. Um, second track, Best I Can. Beneath, Between and Behind, by Tor and the Snow Dog, my favorite track on here, which has got about three different parts to it, some amazing bass work from Giddy Lee, incredible bassist, had, a, had quite a growl to his bass, I think in those days he was still using a Rickenbacker bass. Um, side two, you've got Fly By Night, also a hit off the album, Making Memories, Rivendell, and In The End, great album. And this would pretty much be the, the blueprint for the 70s sound, the second album. Check it out if you haven't yet. Amazing stuff. So the record company weren't that enamored with that album and they didn't get a lot of good press and what have you. So the guys were a bit despondent. So I think the record company were looking for something a little bit more commercial. And what these guys did with the third album was bring out something which was nothing like a commercial album. In fact, it was even more like Fly By Night. So I'm talking about Caress of Steel. I love that cover. Um, this is one of my favorite early Rush albums and the drumming in particular on here and the bass playing and the whole thing is just incredible from these three guys. Bastille Day, which was a, a great song. I Think I'm Going Bold. Lakeside Park, which has got some amazing acoustic work as well. There's a lot of good acoustic stuff in their early albums. The Necromancer, which is a total time of 12 minutes and 29 seconds. You can see where we're going with the early style here. Uh, the Fountain of Lamnath, the Fountain of Lamnath, which is another 19 minutes and 58 seconds. And that's pretty much the album. So it's a very, some very long tracks, a lot of intricate time uh, pieces in the, in the songs, time changes, great vocals from Giddy Lee. In those days, his voice was right up here, very high pitch. A lot of people don't like his vocals. And I'm, I must admit, it takes some getting used to, especially the early stuff. But if you can get past that and just concentrate on the music, it's amazing. Um, let's see. These are the remasters which came out a while back. And they have actually done a really good job with these remasters. You've got the lyrics and you've got some live shots of the guys from the early days there. 
So that's the third album, Caress of Steel. As I said, one of my favorites. Then we go to a game changer. Um, they were really upset with what the critics were saying after that one. They thought they were going to crack it with Caress of Steel. So they thought, bugger it, we're just doing what we want to do. And, uh, you know, sink or swim. And they brought out the amazing concept album, 2112. This was probably my, if not top rush album in the top five. Um, it's, it's a really interesting and innovative album. Um, you know, a lot of the early prog rock bands like Yes and Genesis had a lot of this sort of stuff, in, but these guys had their own sound. And to come out of a place like Canada, I don't think there were too many prog rock bands out of Canada at that stage. Um, so yeah, they had something really different. And this was produced by Russian Terry Brown. Terry Brown was their producer for quite a few albums in the early days. So it starts off with 2112, which is 20 minutes and 34 seconds long. Uh, there's about six different parts to that. A passage to Bangkok, the Twilight Zone, Lessons, Tears, and Something for Nothing. Amazing. You listen to this with headphones on, you just get taken away. Um, great guitar work from Alex Lifeson. Like I said, not very flashy, but he could let rip when he wanted to. And the tone on his guitar, he had a certain sound. You know, that's the thing with guitarists. If you can get your own sound, that's half the battle won. Um, some of the clothing, though, was a bit uh, suspect. Sarongs and uh, velvety pants and what have you. But hey, that was the clothing. As long as the music worked, I didn't care what they looked like. And when I heard this album back in the day, it just blew my mind. So that's 2112. Another one of my favorites, we move on to, uh, this was about 19, I think 21, 2112 was 76. I think this was 77. The Farewell to Kings. Great album. And a lot of the tracks on these early albums, they played right up until the end. The Farewell to Kings, Xanadu, my favorite track on here with great um, vocals from Giddy Lee. Uh, that's about 11 minutes. Closer to the Heart, another great track with some great acoustic work. Cinderella Man, Madrigal, and Cygnus X1, 10 minutes and 21 seconds. Brilliant stuff. Um, if you're looking for a good modern prog rock album, uh, as opposed to the early Yes and uh, King Crimson stuff, this is one to go for. That was uh, sort of like the emblem there, and there the guys back in the day. Um, Neil Peart's drum kit was getting bigger and bigger as the tours were going on. He used a lot of timpani, a lot of percussion stuff as well, not just plain drumming. Um, he was the, the complete package. And uh, the songwriting in these early albums is amazing. If you read the lyrics, some of them are quite out there, but it sort of works within the framework of the song and the style and everything else. It was, it was just the, the early style which would change quite radically later on, but we'll get to that in the next episode. And then the last album I want to chat about from the, from the 70s, this was 1978, I think. Hemispheres, also great album. Once again, remastered, done a really good job with this. Um, so here we have Cygnus X1 Book 2, as opposed to Book 1 from the previous album. So this is kind of like a follow-on from A Farewell to Kings. Hemispheres, which is 18 minutes and 4 seconds. Uh, that includes about 6 different pieces. Circumstances, The Trees, which is a great track. All about um, trees having issues. And obviously they're talking about humans as well as opposed to trees. And probably the best guitar piece that uh, Alex Lifeson ever did in my book. A track called La Villa Strangiata. Strangiata. When he breaks out into that lead piece on there, well, the feeling that he has is just mind-blowing. I actually get goosebumps if I think about it right now. Produced once again by Terry Brown. Hemispheres. Brilliant album. You can't go wrong with any of these early ones, actually. And they've all been remastered. The only one I don't have on CD is the uh, Fly By Night. Still sounding great on vinyl, though. 
and the guys over there and you have all the lyrics as well which make for some interesting reading so there we go episode one of rush like i said in the second episode we're going to check out some of the 80s stuff very different sounding um, some of the earlier ones still sounded like the um, the 70s but as the 80s rolled on they changed quite a bit and i think they alienated some of the early fans um, you know you get two camps the guys that only enjoy the early stuff and then the guys who quite in, got into them later into the 80s but anyway we'll check that out in the next episode thanks for watching guys please like and subscribe down below any comments are really welcome love to hear from you guys nice to see if i'm saying the correct things or concentrating on the right bands but i think with music you need to cover all the bases which is why i've decided to dive into the prog rock scene um, which is something that I'm still very fond of. Have a great week. Take it easy. Stay safe. I'll see you soon. Cheers.